Ahoy, ahoy, wrestling fans. Welcome to the third episode of Smack Talk here from Smart Out Moment. I am your host, as always, Tony Mango. Today, all the way from the UK, is actor Michael Burhan. And all the way from down the street from me is, returning once again, Chris Dace. Say hello, everybody. Hey. How's it going out there, the Dace-tacular ones? Nobody is Dace-tacular. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got a couple things on the bill tonight. Uh, let's just start off with something we talked about a little bit before with Evan Bourne's suspension. Now, main story here is not the suspension itself, because we already went over that, but more so the controversy that it's causing. Now, one of the things that I'm hearing, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but I'm hearing that there's a little bit of a hearsay backstage that when he was partaking in said drug, whatever the hell it is, Spice, I think they are calling it, other superstars higher up on the totem pole were doing it as well. And there's a little bit of, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, um, bad feelings going around in WWE right now because they're thinking if the main eventers who aren't named, so I don't know who, um, <clears throat> maybe Cena, uh, <laughs> Randy Orton. <laughs> <laughs> if these main eventers are getting away with doing this, and Evan Bourne, just because he's a mid-carder, is getting suspended for it, that, obviously, that that's bullshit. I completely agree if that's what's going on. Everybody should be held for the same standards as everybody else. I heard it was the Muppets. It might have been. I don't know. Beaker looked a that. little fucked up, didn't he? <laughs> and Fozzie, he had those, like, half-opened eyes. Well, there was that whole thing with uh, whatever they gave to Santino, so... I don't know. Well, if Kermit's banging Miss Piggy, he must be on something. <laughs> well, what are you thinking? I'm thinking if somebody along the lines of like a Randy Orton or John Cena or obviously a Triple H, if they're getting away with doing this, obviously there's the backstage politics we've heard about all the time where they just don't value Evan Bourne as pretty much anybody. And I That's think if... Politics in any organization is pretty much the same thing. You know, they've got a certain hierarchy. I remember when I was um, wrestling the independent circuit way back when, um, there was like literally you had the guys at the top, the guys in the mid card, and everybody else. You know, and certain guys had more of an advantage over others. It's like you wouldn't necessarily suspend a Randy Orton or John Cena. Um, because that will hurt your business, but suspending someone like Evan Bourne is not really going to hurt like the gate at the moment. You know, yes, they are building up the tag team division at this point in time, but it's not really going to do anything to damage Bourne's credibility. True. Yeah, it sucks because when it comes, like he said, the hierarchy of the business, you got like if they were to follow through with their entire uh, like process with suspending people on this uh, drug abuse and stuff like that. They lose half their roster. And because of that, they have to make an example out of somebody to keep the bottom people in charge, like in check. But those top guys keep uh, skating through. Well, see, I can understand completely why they would do that kind of a thing. But if the whole point is supposed to send a message to everybody else, <clears throat> then you would think that they would need to really send a message. They would take out one of these guys just for a little bit of time or at least fine him or do something like that. Cause if they start getting this idea that just the mid carters are the only ones that are going to get damaged with this kind of a wellness policy, then the guys that are at the top are just going to keep doing whatever they're doing because this message clearly doesn't go through with them. Well, it depends on the intent, doesn't it? Cause if you think about it, you know, it, this whole wellness policy is a PR thing. Um, you know, yeah. yeah, it is used to to help certain people occasionally. You know, they've had the the, the well documented thing about MVP that he had a heart condition and they found wow. out about it um, after doing the whole wellness check thing. But mostly, it's a PR thing, so you're not really going to get the guys at the top of the totem pole, like you know, the guys who are very PR friendly, like John Cena or Randy Orton. Um, in this situation. You would look to guys like Evan Bourne because you know it's not going to hurt business as much. I don't know. To me, <clears throat> if uh, if they're going to go for somebody who uh, 
is failing the wellness policy and everything like that. Obviously, a tag team champion like an Evan Bourne is some kind of a message, but I think they're uh, they're just too flexible right now on who they punish and who they don't. Like they've punished people in the past that you wouldn't really accept uh, uh, expect them to. Like I think uh, what was it? Rey Mysterio was was he suspended once or twice? I can't remember. I know he's at least once. He was suspended once, but that was because he didn't have um, proof of the medication that he was taking. He just basically got tested, couldn't provide them with anything, even though he says that he had a doctor's note. Um, got suspended, waited out his time, and then just came back better than ever. Um, than ever, you know. Well, the one thing that I'm, uh, I guess, if anybody doesn't know, I'm uh, a staunch supporter of people not getting into drugs. Uh, for no particular reason, just I don't see the point in it. But if this isn't working, where they're suspending these guys for uh, wellness policy failures that are based off of this fake marijuana, and they used to just fine the people, uh, I think a thousand dollars, and I think it's up to twenty five hundred now. If they these still guys, do it with the, like, the normal marijuana, but the norm, with this yeah. stuff, apparently it's more lethal. That's if why that's, they're sort of suspending. If that's the problem that they're coming across, where this thing, I think uh, Chris was talking about it last week, that uh, this is something that's more of a problem, I don't know why they don't just go back to fining and not do the suspensions. Because I would think the fining would hit you immediately. And the suspension, you get to rest a little bit, you know, it's, you still get, uh, you lose money, but WWE loses money at the same time. If you just suspend these guys, you're making money off of them and they're not getting as much paid. I'd rather be the type of person that would get uh, 30 days off, a little bit of time to rest and, you know, lose a couple thousand dollars than to be a couple thousand dollars less. And next, the next night I have to go right back out there and start working for the company again. I think it should be both like they did before when um, Orton had his first suspension, you know, they'll do it where they would have to work the live shows for free. Um, and they weren't allowed to like work any house shows. Um, and they would like during this time period, they would not actually earn any money until the 30 day suspension was up, which I think, I think would hurt them even more. The, the majority of it too, probably is just WWE covering their ass just in case they get into another Benoit incident. So they're just saying, look, we are, we are disciplining somebody. Maybe not all of them, but at least somebody. And it's kind of like the uh, sacrificial lamb to the media. But when it comes to the favorites, another thing that people have been talking about is that they're upset with this push that Mason Ryan is getting. Now, there's not oh, a huge, God. there's not a huge thing going on where you know people are fighting backstage, as far as I'm aware. But there's uh, there's a little bit of uh, <clears throat> animosity towards the Mason Ryan push, and I can understand it to an extent because Mason Ryan clearly is not the most seasoned uh, performer, either on the mic or in the ring. The guy's green. He's extremely, extremely green. But at you the know, same time, you kind of got to give him a little bit of credit that they're doing something with him. How many yeah, people... What, in the what is there to do with the guy, you know, like with the Nexus? At least he had Punk as his mouthpiece. Now he just stands there, looks freaky, and, you know, everyone expects to, to get him over. And especially the fact that he's got a body that, you know, only chemicals could buy. <laughs> yeah, if you look at, like, uh, Lesnar, who had Heyman kind of guide him before he went on his own, and then you had Batista, who had uh, Flair and Triple H guiding him before his own, Mason Ryan definitely needs that mouthpiece to guide him before he can become one of those type guys. Well, he needs to get better in the ring, too. I mean, as much as uh, talking can get you somewhere, you're still going to have to back it up in the ring, and he clearly isn't at that level yet, but... A lot of people seem to hate him just for the reason that he's a big guy and Vince has this reputation of liking the big guys. But I don't know. I mean, to me, the level that he's at right now is pretty much justified. They don't have Alex Riley right now because he's injured to be able to fall back on. And Morrison is kind of 50-50 on his way out. I mean, he won this match with Dolph Ziggler last week, so maybe that's going to change. And I hope it is because I like Morrison. But at the same time, who are they going to fall back on when they need this other person on Raw? Right now, they've got this Raw and SmackDown exchange, but that's not going to go on forever. And still, SmackDown needs their people. So Mason Ryan right now is filling in a void that they really need. So this push that he's getting, uh, he's not getting the world title or anything like that. He's just on the Survivor Series card. So is Hunico, you know? But is it me, or does the guy look constipated when he's doing promos? 
He, he looks like he wants to cop a squat right in the middle of the ring. Um, <laughs> I can I see know. that when he walks down the ramp, it looks like he's going to drop a deuce. Right when he does the, uh, the, the Jericho pose. Oh, yeah. He's just one of these guys where I, I believe um, he, there's a lot more talented guys on the roster that could take that spot, and you're giving it to a guy who's literally um, should have should have stayed in developmental. You know, he should have stayed in FCW um, to get a bit more season training, um, which is one of the major problems with the mele- developmental system they've got at the moment because these guys aren't getting the training they're supposed to. You know, um, and Secondly, it's because he looks a lot like Batista that he's even getting any sort of push. You know, the guy is literally a spitting image of Dave Batista, who was at the, you know, before he even left the company, was really green himself. But at least he had flair to help get him over. You know, he had him, he had Triple H, he had Evolution. Ryan hasn't got anyone, and it shows. You know, his ring work is shoddy, his mind skills are terrible. And, you know, the guy looks like he should be wearing a pair of the pens when he gets in the ring. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe this is going to be one of those things that they look back at and he just becomes another Bam Neely or something like that where they gave him a push too far, too fast, and he goes nowhere. Maybe he's going to be the next Lesnar and we just don't see it yet. I think he's got some potential, but... As far as the people that are complaining that he has too much of a push, I tend to disagree. As far as the people that think they're going to push him too far, I completely agree with that. I do think that they will go too far. They just haven't gone as far yet. I wouldn't mind him being in a tag team, actually. You know, at least with there, you can control the sort of push he gets. You can get a title around his waist, and at least he'll learn from someone if they pair him up with a veteran. But at this point in time, he hasn't got the skill to actually take his push any further and if they do try and push him further than what he's capable of which is not very much he's going to end up crashing and burning you know and it's not really going to help him because I, I you know he's um another like well I, you could call him kind of he's supposed to be british but he's not he's i think he's more on a um on the other side of the fence but when it comes down to it he's one of these guys that has a you know, a, a boatload of potential, but needs the work to actually get him to that stage. You know, he's just it, it's the same really as well. Because if they actually used shows like Next to their potential, we could have seen him on there. You know, getting over instead of seeing him on Raw, which is considered the A show, literally cutting these awful promos. And trying to be Mr. Intensity, you know, and the, I think that's the main issue with it as well, because the veterans feel he's not ready to be even in that position. Well, somebody else, you're talking about crashing and burning, that has been uh, kind of going back and forth with the whole push thing recently is David Hart Smith, otherwise known as his real name, Harry Smith. Uh, Smith has been talking about how he feels he didn't get much of a support uh, when he was in WWE. I tend to agree a little bit with this. Now, he was saying if he were given the same skyrocket push that Drew McIntyre and Sheamus and Del Rio and a couple other people that they were given, that he would have been much more successful. To an extent, yeah. to an extent I agree. Now... McIntyre and Sheamus and Del Rio are three people that I thought that they pushed too hard too fast, like what I was saying with that they might be uh, eventually doing with Mason Ryan. But at the same time, Smith had quite a while that he could have connected with the audience. And he was on the mic, what, a handful of times from what I can remember, never cut a decent promo. His in-ring stuff, I mean, nothing that I would complain about. He certainly did a hell of a lot better job than I would have done. But uh, there was just nothing there, kind of like what Ted DiBiase is struggling with. There's nothing that is separating him from the herd. Tyson Kidd, he's got a little bit of problems on his end, but at the same time, he was slightly better on the mic, better in the ring as far as I'm concerned. Smith, I don't know, from when he started as Harry Smith and then D.H. Smith and then David Hart Smith, it seemed like no matter what they did with him, even the tag team title run, he was just another guy. 
So I have to disagree with him about if he had that skyrocket push, he would have really gone somewhere. He would have gone higher, but he still would have just fallen by the wayside right afterward, I think. The big problem with him, um, and it, it kind of fails to compare him to guys like Del Rio and McIntyre. Because if you look at McIntyre and Del Rio, these guys have personality, whereas David Hart Smith lacks the, you know, personality. Um, he actually, this guy came from the British Bulldog, who had oodles of personality as long as he had his ring ability as well at the same time. It's like he got his personalities from his mum's side because she was a bit of a plank anyway. Um, but with him, I, I think the push that he got to the tag titles was even a better, you know, it was the best push that he was going to get. Um, they should just kept him in the tag team with um, Tyson Kidd and see how they went from there. You know, not separate the guys too and then had him just literally lingering in limbo because he wasn't you know he, he's, he's not capable of doing anything else yes he has all the ability in the world but if you can't sell your character to the fans how what are you going to do what is it that else is there for you to do yeah he, he never really seemed like an intercontinental or u.s title type guy to me uh he just he had that bland look he had the bland mic skills he just wasn't someone who was uh sticking out or looked like he was trying to stick out while he was there like an uh, example, Zack Ryder. But he's just somebody who never really went above and beyond the call. He went out there, did his tag match, did the technical skills, and then that was it. Well, one thing that I think that they missed the boat on was back before <clears throat> they started the whole Heart Dynasty thing, which I do think was a good idea, there were so many rumors that Legacy was going to be 10 times bigger than what it was. We were going to have. Uh, you know, Manu, Rhodes, DiBiase, Orton, uh, even people were talking about Jesse from Jesse and Festus because he was uh, second generation. And we were going to have Smith, Natalia, uh, Steamboat, Brett DiBiase. This was going to be a huge NWO type of stable. And then they ended up, of course, uh, replacing half of those guys with Sim Snuka, which is, I mean, give me a fucking break. And Manu, who turned out to be completely worthless. And then it just became a standard three-person uh, setup right there. So I think if Smith would have been put in that group and they could have splintered off and made kind of like a legacy versus Heart Dynasty feud, he could have developed a, enough personality in that time to switch. When he would switch over, people would start to get behind him. Because, of course, the Hearts would have to be the faces of the... You know, the people like Orton and Rhodes and everybody else were a part of uh, the heel side. So with Smith coming right into WWE as a uh, clean cut baby face that wrestles, what, two matches with Carlito. And then you don't see him again for like two years. And then he just comes back and, oh, now he's a bad guy. And he's teaming up with Tyson Kid, who hasn't even gotten over with the crowd yet. There was really nowhere for him to go. So when he eventually worked his way up to being able to carry the tag team titles it was good and it was fine but n he had nothing to grab onto neither of them had any personality yet they were just we know these guys are related to the hearts and that's it if they would have cut out the intro music nobody would even know that yeah, but part of the blame has to lie on david hartsmith's shoulders as well because think about it they actually hired him from the fact that he was a journeyman um kind of wrestler you know comparing in comparison to punk guys like steve carino guys who went from um territory to territory he had training in japan came over to the states worked for a load of indie promotions in the states they thought he was ready um but the issue is if you had all that training how comes you can't be as charismatic as punk who had no one literally behind him there was no machine behind him he had no one talking for him he went out there and he did his thing you know, why couldn't Smith do the same thing? But, you know, it was just, I think it wasn't to do with um, training or the fact that the WWE needed to get him a, a charismatic gimmick or put him in a stable. I think it lays on him because he couldn't sell his character. Well, it certainly does. I just think that when he talks about the skyrocket push, he's got a point there. 
Not really, because if you look at Drew McIntyre and if you look at Del Rio, they at least have personality. Del Rio can get his character over. You know, uh, McIntyre can get his character over. I don't think Smith could have done that. And that was one of the reasons why they got that push, where Smith was just a technical wrestler, but they, they were a dime a dozen. Yeah, and I, I think he, he fell into that complacent zone for a while, like Carlito did, whereas I'm coming out, I'm getting a paycheck, and I'm technically doing what I love to do. So, like he, like Micah said, I think the uh, blame falls on DH as well as it does the WWE. Well, when we uh, go into part two, we're going to talk a little bit more about WWE doing what they feel is best for themselves and what they feel is best for the company. We're going to talk a little bit about relationships. So stay tuned, check out the next video.